And what I'm doing, the Lord being my helper, I'm going to start a series of messages on the life of Moses. The life of Moses. And again, if you at any time decide, you know, that uh, you, you might be prudent for you and your family to go home, why well, you feel free to do so. I understand that. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse number 15. I love to study the men of the Bible and the women of the Bible, people of, the people of Scripture. But only in so much as, and I want you to get a hold of this one, you've got your hand out there about Moses being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph is a great type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're doing some Bible study here this morning is what we're going to do. And one of the reasons I want to take, boy, by the way, Terry, what a message. What a Sunday school lesson. Man, I'll tell you what, we, we, can, we can work on that dude for a long time. And that's great. But uh, uh, I do this to build us up in the faith, to feed the flock of God. Um, I love the Old Testament. I love the New Testament. But I love the Old Testament because it makes the New Testament just spring forth like a flower. And there's so much in there to see. And, and, uh, but only in so much studying, like, uh, you, we get strength and we get wisdom and we get, I mean, direction and, and all kinds of things from studying the lives of the people in the Old Testament. I mean, can you imagine, I'll be honest with you, outside of Jesus Christ, there's probably never been a greater man. I mean, Jesus said about John the Baptist. I'm telling you, Moses is a historical figure. You know, it's amazing to me. We ought to be making, we ought to be requiring every child in America's education to have to have a good knowledge of the life of Moses before he gets out of school. If we want to raise up leaders, we want to know how to face adversity. We want to know uh, uh, how to uh, have a society and a culture that God can bless. This man ought to be studied, but only in as much as we see him in, we see him in Christ. And we see him as a type of Christ and his position in the whole work of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you get into Deuteronomy chapter 18, there's a prophecy, verse number 15. And Moses said this. He said, the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, capital P, from the midst of thee of thy brethren, like unto me. Underline that. Like unto me. Unto him you shall hearken. So we don't have to guess this morning whether or not Moses is a type of Jesus Christ. The Bible's telling us that Jesus is going to be raised up. This prophet Jesus is going to be raised up. And he's going to be like Moses. Now, you can take your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Go to Now, hold hold Deuteronomy and go to Acts chapter 3. And I want to show you how much in the New Testament this is is brought forth. Acts chapter 3. And... uh, and we're just having Bible study here this morning, I, and I, but it's a, such a blessing. I hope you get a lot of Acts chapter 3, verse number 22. And uh, Peter is preaching his second message in the book of Acts here now after the day of Pentecost. And verse 22 says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, here it is, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. What is Peter preaching? Peter is preaching that he's going back to the Old Testament. He is affirming to those Jewish people, this has already been prophesied, and Jesus is who uh, Moses was prophesying about. So he's taking the Old Testament, he's saying, and this is how you rightly divide the word of truth. This is how you know whether what you believe is right or not. This is whether you know, I mean, who has the right to say Moses is the type of Jesus Christ? You get it out of the Bible. If you go to Acts chapter 7, and just to show you how much there is, it's used, Stephen is in the, uh, uh, preaching before he is stoned. He is preaching to the Jewish people there. And you pick it up in about verse number 20, Acts chapter 7. And he's preaching, and basically what Stephen is doing is giving a chronological history of the, New Test, of the Old Testament, showing them how that Jesus Christ is foreshadowed, in all of that. And if you really want to read it right, you have to see Jesus in it. Remember when Jesus met the two disciples on the Emmaus Road? The Bible said he spake unto them out of Moses and the prophets things concerning himself. And I want to tell you, as a child of God, if, you, if you're saved, first of all, you've got to have love for the Bible if you're saved. You've got to want to know the Bible. That's the bread of life. And man alive, when you start seeing Christ from Genesis to Revelation, it's just a blessing to know you have a God-written, a God-ordained book. That's constantly bringing out the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Stephen was a deacon. Uh, some say he was there. He was a servant of the Lord. And he uh, uh, was preaching here. And he preaches through the Old Testament. It comes down to verse 20. In which time Moses was born. Now, we're going to learn some things about Moses. It's real important here. 
and was exceeding fair, nourished up in his father's house three months. Tells you how long he was in his father's house. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brother would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. Now, everything you're reading right here is telling you the foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number 26. Next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one, one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do you wrong one to another? Now, I want you to underline that in your Bible. I'm not preaching about this. But please underline that in your Bible. Make a little notation there. Don't do wrong to your brethren. Why do you wrong to one another? Sirs, you are brethren. You know what I heard a guy say about that in the Old Testament? Was And Abraham, when he had trouble with Lot, he said, we be brethren. Let there be no strife between us. And I want to encourage Liberty Faith Church this morning. We're brethren. So don't do each other wrong. So don't talk about each other, run each other down, get it in for each other and all that kind of junk. Let's be brethren. This is critical in Scripture. And Moses was is talking about uh, to his brother there back in, in Exodus. Verse 27. But he that did his neighbor wrong, watch this now. He, I want to tell you something. You learned something right here. He that did his neighbor wrong, thrust him away. Did you know that the person, oh, well, this is good, saying, who may be a ruler and judge over us? The guy who was doing wrong thrust Moses away and said, don't tell me how to live my life and don't you be a, try to be a judge or ruler over me. Now, you can take that little truth, that little nugget right there. It's a gold nugget in it. And you can learn about what's going on in your spiritual life when you're having problems and people are doing stupid things and Christians are doing stupid things. And, uh, and, and what it's, it's powerful. Verse 28, Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? And then fled Moses this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian for where he beget two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire and bush. Moses saw it, he wandered to sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and durst not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off the shoes off, put thy shoes up from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groanings. I am come down to deliver them, and now come, and I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge, the same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush? He brought them out after they had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and the Red Sea and the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Here it is again, Deuteronomy 18:15, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. Now, we're not going to go ahead with the rest of that right there. It is, continues the history, but what I did that for, I showed you two times in the book of Acts. Where Deuteronomy 15, verse 18 is quoted, okay? So it's quoted there. Now, Lord, help us today as we feed the flock of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm not going to get this done. So, somebody tell me what time it is right now. 11.15. 11.15. Okay. I'm pro- I may get it. I don't know. I'm going to really try to cut this off at 12 sharp so, you know, so nobody can say, well, he, he put me out at afternoon and we had a wreck. <coughs> Before noon, it's between you and God. After dinner, it's between me, you, and God, Okay. <laughs> Okay, let's look at this handout I gave you this morning. Moses, the type of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to run down through these real quick. Uh, he, a king seeks to slay him in his babyhood. That's true of both of them. His mother has a God-given convictions about him. Number three, he is saved by hiding in Egypt. Number four, he has a premature experience. I'm going to, I'm going to let you read this when you get down to it. But I want you, there's one thing down here that I'm going to do other than this that, that uh, I want you to see. And that's down in verse uh, in number 19. Everybody see number 19. Okay. There is a plan of salvation, number 17, that it revealed. But the plan is laid out on the cross. How, can anybody here this morning, just Bible class, how did Moses lay out the plan of salvation on the cross? Huh? Brazen serpent is a picture. That's, that's good. That's not, but I hadn't thought about that. But that's a good. Brazen serpent is a, is a picture of Jesus being lifted up on the cross. Huh? Striking the rock is a picture. 
But there's a specific thing that he laid out, the plan of salvation for the children of Israel. I didn't even get my but Would you get me a board up here real quick, please? I appreciate Stephen. It's on. Hang on. Keep going, huh? Reproach your Christ. Yeah. I'm talking about he let, number 19 there says he laid the plan of salvation out in the form of a cross. The tabernacle. The tabernacle. The tabernacle is the, God's plan of salvation. And if you look at the tabernacle, when you, if you had it set like this, you go in the door and it's, it, you'll find everything set in a cross. And if you looked at it from the sky, you see that the plan of salvation, and by the way, it's when you come through the door of the tabernacle, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Okay. Then you go to the labor. I'm the water of, I'm the water of life. You go into the uh, candlestick. I am the light of the world. The table of showbread. I am the bread. The, the altar of incense. He's our intercessor. And then he is God in the deal. But if you look at it, it's laid out in a, it's laid out in a cross. You start at the bottom, it goes up, and then to the to the Ark of the Covenant. But down here, it's got the lampstand and the table of showbread. It's all laid out in a cross. So anyway, that's one thing I want to get. Jesus laid the plan of salvation out on a cross. Okay. Now I did that for this reason to whet your appetite a little bit. We're going to do something that most preachers won't do in a church because you know why? Now watch this. They do not think that the people in the church have a deep enough interest to want to even know these things. Now, let me tell you something. Many pa- there, and it's not, it's not saying bad about the pastors. They've just been convinced that the people do not have an interest of the deeper things of God and that it would be boring to them and that they need some kind of a topical sermon and so forth. Uh, but I don't, believe that's, I don't believe that's true about you people. And so I, I want to, again, do this. And I'll, I'll do this real quick. We're going to take off. But here's the tabernacle of the wilderness, okay? You had the white fence around. And here's the tabernacle proper inside. And it had the two sections. This is the holy place, most holy place. And here, again, is the door. And here's the laver. Here is the uh, table of showbread. Here is the lampstand. And here is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, does anybody see that? There's a cross right here. Every one of those things speaks of Jesus and his redemptive work. And the whole thing is a cross. Uh, Zach and Jamie were in Florida recently. Didn't you go down to the Florida? It's called a Holy Land deal or something. And they have, they showed me pictures of it. I got to look at it. They've got a tabernacle, full size tabernacle, and the stuff they got down there is amazing. But here's the deal when God gave this stuff to Moses, it was a picture of Jesus Christ. The tabernacle picture of Jesus Christ, what he was going to do on the cross for. So, I'm going to just go down through some things this morning. How Moses is a type of Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is interesting. How many we got on here? 24? Guess what? I come up with at least 64. It's almost, there's no bottom to it. So, you just kind of take the, if you want to write on this one and write on the back, I'm going to go fast. Are you ready? Here we go. Number one. I'm going to give you some, con- uh, don't even write these down. I'm going to give you some contrast, first of all. Moses was a child of a slave, but the son of a queen. Moses was born in a slave hut, but lived in a palace. Now, you think about this, and all this is going to point to what Jesus Christ's life was. Jesus, born in a manger, an enslaved people, came from, pa- but has a palace. Uh, he was an heir of poverty, but he's also had unlimited wealth. Jesus said he made himself poor that we might be rich. He was a leader of armies, but he was also a leader of flocks. Jesus is the same. Jesus is the good shepherd to the flock, but he will lead the armies of God. Amen. Moses, well, this is so good. He was, you read it and you're hearing, Mother, he's one of the mightiest men that ever lived. And yet the Bible said he was the meekest man that ever lived. If you and I want to be Christ-like, we need to be mighty in spirit, but meek and lowly in heart. He was educated in the ways of Egypt, but God gave him his real training in the wilderness away from Egypt. And what God is teaching us there is that 
You can get all the education you want, but I'll tell you, you'll never know what you need to know till you get along with God. He had the wisdom of Egypt, the Bible said, but he had the faith of a child. He was prepared in the cities, but he lived in the wilderness. P- pick up on that. Jesus went to the wilderness. He was tempted with the pleasures of sin. Jesus was tempted, but he endured the hardness of holiness. Moses was backward in speech, but he could talk to God face to face. Moses had a rod of a shepherd. Jesus will have a rod. I'll get to that later. But he also had the power of God Almighty. Moses was a fugitive of Pharaoh, but he was an ambassador for the Lord. He was a giver of the law, but a forerunner of grace. He died alone on Moab, but he appeared with Christ in the Mount Transfiguration. No man attended his funeral, yet God buried him. He died in the wilderness, but he was risen and appeared in Canaan. And Moses' lips are silent, but his message will go forth for eternity. Now, let's do these contrasts, and here we go. Number one, Moses was an Israelite, so was Jesus Christ of the brethren. Number two, both of them were born when Israel was under the dominion of a foreign power. Moses under the Egyptians, Jesus under the Romans. Moses, in Acts chapter 7, 27, said he was exceeding fair. God said about Jesus, this is my beloved son. And the, and the Song of Solomon said he's the fairest of 10,000. Moses, in his infancy, his life was threatened by the murder of children. By the ruler, Jesus, when he was a child, his life was threatened by the rulers, Herod. Moses was adopted and became her son. Jesus was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. He was, uh, Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Jesus was adopted by Joseph. Both of them were adopted. Childhood, Moses in his, Moses was down in Egypt, and Jesus fled to Egypt. And a prophet said, he called my son out of Egypt. Both of them had a love for Israel. In Acts chapter 7, he, he came into his heart to visit Israel. Jesus came and wept over Jerusalem and the people of Israel. Both of them had an early knowledge of their life's mission. In Acts chapter 7, Moses Assumed that they would know that God was going to deliver him by his hand. Jesus said in Luke 21, Wished you not that I must be about my father's business when he was 12 years old. Both of them were humble and had humility. Moses, the Bible said, though a son of Pharaoh, identified himself with his brethren Israel. Jesus, though he was the son of God, he was not ashamed to call them brethren. In other words, Moses was up here in the palace, you know, as an adopted son. Jesus Christ is the Son, and both of them lowered themselves to go minister to their brethren. Both of them had what we would call a great renunciation. And to me, this has been one of my life's verses in Hebrews chapter 11. It says that he refused to, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, rather to endure the pleasures of sin for a season. Jesus, the Bible said, made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and made the like of the Son of God. And both of them relinquished and renounced riches and glory and honor to do the will of the Lord. Moses, in Acts chapter 7, watch this, was rejected by his brethren at his first coming. Remember when he was full 40 years old, he went out to his brethren, was going to deliver them. And they said, who made you a ruler? That's exactly what they did to Jesus Christ at his first coming. The Jewish people rejected him and and didn't want him as a ruler or a judge over them. Both of them were rejected at their first coming to the nation of Israel. Both of them, after their rejection, and I don't know whether you enjoy this or not, but I just love this stuff. Because, man, I'm telling you something. There ain't no book in the world like this book. You, you don't do this. This is super. What you're hearing right now is supernatural. It's literally supernatural. Both of them, Moses, and he, when he was rejected, guess what he did? He went to the Gentiles, the Midians. What did Jesus do when he was rejected? He went to the Gentiles. Moses, when he was rejected, got a Gentile bride. 
Jesus, when he was rejected, got a Gentile bride. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. It just goes on and on. I mean, isn't it amazing that in Deuteronomy 18:15 that the Holy Ghost inspired Moses to write, The Lord shall raise up a prophet unto you like unto me. And I mean, it's just so many of them. As I said, both of them had, ex- had experienced rejection at, at, their, at their first coming. Get this, I did not, I, I, I had never heard this before. Both of them sat by a well while in rejection. I found this in Exodus 2.15, Moses sat down by a well in Midian. In John chapter 4, verse number 6, Jesus sat down by a well. And talk to the, and talk, and what the picture is that Moses was picturing the water of life, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, as the water of life. Moses became a shepherd in, Ex, in Exodus 3 1. And Jesus became our shepherd and said, I am the good shepherd. Both of them are shepherds. Mo, both of them had a season of, of obscurity in their life. Moses was out there wandering 40 years in the wilderness, nobody knew what was going on. And from age 12 to age 30, you do not know what went on in Jesus' life except that he was a carpenter. Both of them were sin of God. In Exodus 3.10, God said, I will send thee to deliver them. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus, it is said that he was sent to seek and to save the, that which was lost. Both of them were sin of God. Both of them had credentials of their deliverance by miracles. And here's what's really interesting. The first two miracles of both of them had to deal with the serpent and leprosy, which is a type of Satan and sin and their power over it. And let me tell you about any miracle. Any miracle that does not demonstrate God's power over Satan and sin is a false, satanic, antichrist miracle. Jesus' first miracle was his mere power over Satan and his miracle over leprosy. And, and that's the same thing that happened with Moses. Both of them return, will return. Moses was gone for 40 years, but he came back down to Egypt to deliver the children. Jesus Christ will return to deliver Israel during the Great Tribulation, at, toward the end of the Great Tribulation. <clears throat> Both of them returned, though, when it was said they were, that, that, that person is dead who sought thy life. Both of them will be received at the second coming. Moses, when he went back down to Egypt was received by Israel, and when Jesus comes back, he will be received by by the nation Israel. Both of them used rods. Moses had a rod, and the Bible said Jesus Christ will rule with a rod of iron. Both of them will use rods in their work. Both of them proclaimed judgment. Moses warned Pharaoh and proclaimed judgment upon Egypt and Pharaoh. Jesus Christ proclaimed judgment, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Let me just stop here and say that we will do, before very long, a complete study on how the plagues of Egypt are a picture of what's going to happen during the tribulation period. I'm telling you, there's nothing new under the sun. And God delivering Israel out of Egypt with a dress rehearsal and a prefigure of what's going to happen during the tribulation period on the face of this earth. In fact, it was just a little dose of it. Both of them were deliverers. Moses delivered Israel. Jesus delivered sinners out of bondage. Both of them experienced a baptism. Moses, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, they said that they were baptized. Watch this. That the children of Israel were baptized unto Moses. That's what the Bible says. In Romans chapter 6, the Bible said that you and I are baptized unto Jesus Christ. Both of them had their authority challenged. In number 16, Miriam, his sister, and Aaron, his brother, led by Miriam. That's what happened to you, men, when your wife leads you. You'll go into rebellion. <laughs> Smile, okay? Your wife's not going to whoop you after church, boys, okay? I'm serious. There's a lesson there. You watch this thing. You, you read your Bible carefully. You'll find out that Aaron just kind of followed her along in that deal. And uh, anyway, both of them were rebuffed. Jesus was repeatedly rejected and re- rebuffed by the Pharisees and the scribes and by this world. 
the Bible specifically says that both of them were envied. In Psalms 106, the Bible said they envied Moses. Pilate knew that they had delivered Jesus for envy, the Bible says. Both of them were murmured against. The children of Israel murmured against Moses. And Jesus Christ in Luke 15 and John 6, the people and the scribes and the Pharisees, they murmured against our Lord. Both Moses and Jesus were threatened with stoning. Exodus 17 for Moses and John chapter 8 and John chapter 10 for Jesus. Both of them experienced grief and sorrow. Moses in the book of Numbers and Jesus in Isaiah. And both of them were men of self-denial. Moses was willing to have his name blotted out of the book of life for the children of Israel. And Jesus did have his life taken for the children of Israel. Jesus was forsaken by the Father. Moses said he was willing to have it done. Both of them were forgiving. I've been reading the story of Aaron and Miriam. I've been studying Moses. You know what's interesting about Moses? When, whenever he'd have trouble in the congregation, he'd just fall on his face and pray. He'd just fall on his face and pray. And then he always forgave him and always asked God to forgive him. And Lord, don't punish these people for what they've done. I would say that all of us pastors and all of us in leadership ought to learn the leadership lessons. By the way, we're going to do leadership lessons from Moses. How do you lead people? How do you lead a family? How do you lead a flock? And uh, again, America needs leaders. Both of them were forgiven. Mo- both Moses and Jesus were great men of prayer. Moses in Exodus 5, Exodus 8, Exodus 9, Exodus 14, and Exodus 17. Moses was a great man of prayer. Jesus Christ was often praying all night and alone. Both of them were meek. The Bible said that Moses was meek above all the men of the earth. He was meek. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 11, says he was meek and lowly. Moses prayed for and interceded for his people. Jesus interceded for us. Both of them, the Bible said, were faithful in the work that God had called them to do. Both of them brought water out. Moses smote the rock and water came out. And Jesus, when he was smote on the cross, brought the water of life out to you and I. Both of them provided bread in the wilderness. Moses had bread come down from heaven. Jesus provides the bread of life for you and I. Both of them were prophets, according to Deuteronomy 18, 18. Both Moses and Jesus were priests that interceded for their people. Both of them were kings. Many people do not know this, but Moses is called a king in Deuteronomy chapter 33. And, of course, you know that Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. Both Moses and Jesus are judges. Moses sat in judgment on the people of Israel, and the Bible teaches us Jesus will be the judge of all the earth. Both of them were leaders and deliverers. Both of them were mediators for people. Moses mediated for the people of Israel. Jesus mediates for you and I this morning. Both of them were mediators of a covenant. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. Both of them were, this is too detailed. It's just, it just, when I do this, I just go, it just might, both of them sent forth 12 men. Moses sent forth 12 spies. Jesus sent forth 12 apostles. I thought, man, that's good until I found this one. Both of them sent forth 70. Moses appointed 70 elders and sent them forth. And Jesus appointed 70 in Luke chapter 10. Y'all see why I'm in, I'm in shock? Y'all understand why I'm just kind of like in... I mean, man. What kind of book is this? What kind of God do we have? And I did this this morning because, you know, I like to preach. And I knew I couldn't just preach it because I ain't smart enough to remember all this in my head. I said, Lord, I'm going to do this, just dogmatically stand by the pulpit and do this, because these people need to know they've got a God that's bigger than all the minds of the world that's ever been put together. Both men were full of wisdom. Both men were known for mighty works. Both were intercessors, as I said. Both had intimate communion with God the Father. And I want to just hit you with this a little bit. Both of them had holy anger. Now, Moses' anger got away from him, but Jesus' anger never did. Jesus, uh, I'm going to tell you something. 
He is called the, it's called the wrath of Almighty God. It's a holy anger. Both Moses and Jesus gave commandments. Both had revelations. Get this one here. Both fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Both experienced a transfiguration on the mount. Moses came off the mount. His face glowed. They couldn't see it. Had to put a veil over him. Jesus Christ on the Mount Transfiguration shined white raiment. Both Moses and Jesus were put outside the camp. Moses in Exodus 33, you have to read that carefully. Both of them were put outside the camp, and we're to follow Jesus outside the camp. Get this one here. Both Moses and Jesus washed their brethren. Moses washed the priest. Jesus washed his disciples. Both completed their work. Exodus 40, it says, so Moses finished the work. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. Both blessed the people that they served. Both anointed tabernacles. And how'd that happen? Moses anointed the tabernacle here. Jesus anoints this tabernacle. You're living in a tabernacle. And the Holy Ghost of God has come and given us an anointing, the Bible said. Do you know how you are, do you know how you are perceiving spiritual truth right now? By the anointing that He has given us. Both died without aging old, even though Moses was 120 years old. The Bible said his natural eyesight was not abated, nor his strength was not weak. He wasn't weak. He was strong. Jesus Christ did not age with, what well, I was talking about, old aging. Both left a successor after them. Moses left Joshua, and Jesus left the Holy Ghost. Both gave inheritances. Moses gave the children of Israel the inheritance of the land, and you and I had the inheritance of eternal life in heaven, a mansion, glory. Both of their deaths were necessary before the fulfillment of their testament. Moses had to die before they went, the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan, and Jesus had to die before you can go to heaven. Guess what number that is? That's 63. We're almost done. Both have a second coming. Moses came back on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus Christ is coming back to the Mount of Olives. He's returning. There are several other things. One of them is this, and I'll just throw this at you, and I don't think I've got this one nailed down, but maybe some of you can help me. The Bible said in the book of Jude that, was it Michael? I'm going to read it so I don't get it wrong. While contending for the body of Moses. I just found another one. We'll make it 65. Just now got it. Just now got it. Moses' body did not see corruption. Is there any how you know that? Because I'm going to tell you something. God resurrected him, and there was a contention for his body. And uh, uh, that takes me to another comparison. We, we'll make 66 here. I think that the fact that the Bible said, it says in the book, in the book of Jude there, can anybody, it's in, the, it's in the book of Jude. Anybody, tell me, what verse? Verse number nine. Yet Mike, ain't Michael the archangel, when he contended, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Durst not bring regular accusation against him, the Lord rebuked thee. I'll tell you what I'm going to guess, is that the old devil did all he could to keep Jesus from being resurrected from the dead. If Michael the archangel contended with Satan over the body of Moses, that tells me that's a prefigure, that's a pre-shadow 
of the contention of the resurrection of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Bible makes such a big deal out of the deliverance of our spirit, soul, and body. And a big deal out of the resurrection. And I want to close this message out by saying this to you today. That being resurrected is a big deal. And I tell you, if you've stood by as many caskets as I've stood by and seen as many people bury as many loved ones as I've seen bury, and you get to thinking about, will I ever see that person again? Resurrection is a big, big deal. And so, anyway, I I just did this morning. You you know what you can't do? You can't go out of here and say that you can't say with an honest heart that this isn't the divine Word of God. You've got an honest heart, you'll have to say that Bible is divine. That Bible is the Word of God. Well, I love you all. What time is it? There's snow flakes as big as half a dollar's out there. It's 11.43? Huh? Sleep? Buddy, if that's sleep, that's the biggest sleep I've ever seen. Well, I sure do love y'all. Y'all enjoy that. I, I hope that'll help you. I want your kids to know that God is real. Amen. And God is real through His Word. And He's, what more can He say? What more can He say? I can't even get that song right. Let's stand together. I'm going to get you out of here. I do not want to be responsible for your accident.